In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, all God's people said. Amen. Holy God, mighty God, immortal God, renew us and refresh us. Thy word is a lamp unto our feet. So God, our footsteps, may we not falter, may we not trip. May we be proven to truly be your sons and your daughters. Glory be to the Father, and to the, Son, and and to the Holy Spirit. Spirit. As, As it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now remember that um, we're talking about Jewish past, Jewish present, and Jewish future. We've gone through last week the patriarchs. They mentioned to you Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Then we, we see a section, verse 19 and following, on the mercy of God. So now notice we've gone into the first five books of the Bible, Moses. And now we're going into verse 25. We're going into the prophets. So in order to understand the Jewish past, you have to get the whole Jewish Bible. So how do you get the whole Jewish Bible? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Torah, and then you get the prophet. And Paul's um, favorite prophet, of course, was Isaiah. Now we're going to go to Hosea, which means the salvation. Remember, you say Hosanna, you can see the word Hosea in there. So now we're going back to the 8th century BC. We're going back to the year about 760 BC. There was another man who wrote at this time called Amos. And then we had Hosea. And they preached where, sister? To the north. Very good. And what was the north called? Israel. Israel. Very good, sister. So let's get going here. Verse 22. What if God desired to show his wrath to make his power uh, known his power was endured with much patience the vessels of wrath? So the Jews are called the vessels because he wanted to fill them with all the good things of God. Now, the good things of God, as we've shown you in our first session, was all those wonderful things in verse four. Remember we did, we drew the menorah together and we spent a lot of time on that. So now there's vessels and vessels are what you use in the what? Temple. And then we went to Timothy and we looked at what's noble use and ignoble use. Noble use is for worship. Ignoble use is for common every kind of day thing. We see in verse 22, we see the wrath of God, okay? Verse 23, in order to make known the riches of his glory. So salvation is the riches of his glory. Now, an interesting thing about glory, again, the Greek word is doxa. When you read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, it says we go from glory to glory. Now, an interesting concept about glowing glory to glory when you go on your destiny with God, the destiny of God never ends. So you got to go from glory to glory. So the most important word there is to. So when you go on your eternal destiny, you got to go from here to here. Amen. So when we are with God and their, their past was to take them from one spot to another, and that happens when the veil is lifted. So we've got to get our veil lifted so we can really see what's going on. So we're, we're going to hopefully keep away from the wrath. So what if God, verse 22, uh, show his wrath, make his power known, he endured with much patience, the vessels of wrath made for destruction. And again, you can see Jeremiah 18 when he threw down the clay pots 
verse 23, in order to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy. And now he wants to empty them. Now, can you see in John chapter 2, why they filled the water up to the brim? Because that was the end of the Old Testament. And Jesus looked in the water, saw his face, and it became wine. Okay, so that's from the vessel there, filled up, um, which he has prepared beforehand for his glory. So all this was prepared beforehand. Verse 24, even whom he has called not the Jews only, but Gentiles. So if you underline verse 24, where we left off last week. Here now is a shocking statement to Jews. That the Jews are the first of salvation. Deuteronomy 7. They are the chosen. Now Paul says we're included. Romans 1, 16 and 7. That's why in the prophet Isaiah, we are told, isn't my father's house a house of what? Prayer. prayer. Amen. It's a prayer for all what? Peoples. Do I hear amen? Amen. Now, we're going to go through, uh, in these verses, a section of Hosea. Um, if you look at verse 25, this is new material now. When Hosea writes, it's eight centuries BC. He's speaking to the north. The north is called Israel. Israel and it's falling away because of idolatry okay. idolatry and idolatry is always plaguing the people so we have Hosea which means the salvation okay so we have Hosea so do you think it's a mistake that Paul picked up a prophet called salvation no I don't think so I think the Holy Spirit led him to that as indeed it says in Hosea. Now, this is uh, an interesting chapter. Hosea chapter 2, verse 23, you can put in there. Hosea 2, 23. When you have this in your Bible, this is the section of being engaged to the Holy Spirit. When you get married to the Holy Spirit, there's got to be a name change. We can see this in Hosea chapter 2. Another thing about Hosea chapter 2, it's getting the prostitute, Gomer, remember Gomer? Yeah. And calling her back to come out of wrath of God to the beloved of God. Thirdly, this is entering the new creation when you get a brand new name you are a brand new person now for each of us your name was chosen for you at birth it was given to you when we go to glory the personality that you are is going to be chosen to you by god there's only two people who are going to know your name, you and God. So look at verse 25. It says there in verse 25 that we can see there Hosea chapter 2, uh, verse 2 and 3. And then it says in, in verse 26, Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Those who are not my people, I will call my people. The word for people in Hebrew is um a m now when you're not god's people you're lo ami l o new word ami a m m i everybody say um, um. ami a m m i ami everybody say ami. ami and then you're called lo ami lo means the word not so everybody say Ami, mm -hmm. A M M I, and now you become Lo Ami. So now look at the context Paul's writing this. He's going to this 
passage in um, Hosea. Now remember, they didn't have numbers and verses back then. So we have to look at it, study the text, and then we have to find out our own, what he was referring to. So we have Ami, and then we have Lo Ami, not my people, and my people. So now, when God deals with the Jews, they were always his people by covenant. Like a mother has a child. That's her kid for all days this side of heaven. Even though you might have a hard time with the child, it's still your child. Do I hear amen? amen. So God says to us, the Jews are still his chosen. Deuteronomy 7. So now we got to get back our status. And our status is to be his sons or daughters. So now we have the, the patriarchs. And now we have the prophets. Uh, those who are not my people, I'll call my people. And who are not beloved, I will call my beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they shall be called sons of the living God. So this is Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. So it is God's plan to redeem the Jews. They are God's people. Now, an interesting thing is going to happen to the Jews when they get conversion. Is everybody here converted to Jesus? Yes. Does everybody have a personal living relationship with Jesus? If you do, I praise God that you are redeemed. But here's the big but. When a Jew gets converted, it's much more than your, our conversion. Why? Because they are in the lineage. You and I cannot understand the expressed joy of a Jew finding Jesus Christ. It's unbelievable what they're experiencing. And sadly... Every one of us will never experience that. We can't imagine. For example, I've never been pregnant, and I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So, but I cannot experience what you mothers have told me. So we can see in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people. And what's that place? That was in Hosea 1 verse 10. And that's where Gomer is having her children born from Hosea. He didn't want to marry her, but guess what? God told her because God wants to never forsake us. So the place is where we have walked away from God, not to be forsaken by him. So Let's go back to Hosea, chapter 1. I'm just looking at verse 10. Now, in this section, Hosea, chapter 1, verse 10, we are going to see a restoration. Yet the number of people of Israel, put a big star by verse 10, shall be like the sand of the sea. There's a promise that God made to Abraham that the Jews will be multiplied. Now, strangely, strangely, there is only worldwide 21 million Jews. That's it. And I think most of them live in Brooklyn, New York. And then the other one is down here in uh, Lakewood. That's where they live. And they're trying to maintain a Jewish way of life. Yet the number of people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, that which can neither measure nor be numbered. In the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it shall be said to them, you are sons of the living God. So now, interestingly there, uh, verse number 10, which we just read, 
be called sons of the living God is when the person knows that they are fully redeemed. And remember I told you my annoyance is when you get, get, get getting called what? Children. Go back, when you look at Romans 1.9, what were, what were you called? Children. Now notice the upgrades. When you're called sons of God, daughters of God, the upgrade is that is the highest compliment that God can give you by being called a son or a daughter. That's why I tell you, please refer to yourself as sons and daughters. The people of Judah, verse 11, and the people of Israel now, Judah is the south, Israel is the north. Now, what's going to happen at the end of time, let me give you a new word based on the word you see there. What's going to be happening at the end of time, this is called, and I don't know if you ever heard, I don't know if I ever shared this term with you. This is called the great regathering. The people of Judah, so circle Judah, put it next to Israel, Judah and Israel, that's all of Israel. Now there's going to be the regathering. When is the birth of the regathering of the Jews? Pentecost, very good. Because how many Jews were at, at Pentecost? They were all Jews. And who was in the middle of them? Mama Mary. So we have Israel and Judah shall be gathered. This is called the regathering. And they shall point for themselves one head. And that's why in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preaches in Acts chapter 3, he's trying to speak to a united Israel and call them all his brothers and sisters. But Peter did say, all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Acts 2 and 21. And so they shall point for themselves one hand. Who's that going to be? The Savior. See the regathering? And they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. The word Jezreel is a valley by Armageddon. Okay, when you look up a little bit to the left, you see a town called Nazareth. The word Jezreel means the scattering. See the place now? So what are we going to do? The Jews have to come to one place now. How do you say place in Hebrew? Makom. M. A U O M. When you have a Macomb and there's a gathering, God puts his name there. So that's the place. And at this place, the Jews will be called Ami. A M M. I, everybody say Ami. Ami. At this place, the Jews will be called sons of the living God. Hello. Why do you think we say the living God? What was their problem? They didn't think he was alive. And what were they dealing with? Their own idolatry. So when you deal with idols, they're not alive. There's a prophecy right there in Hosea. The Jews are going to be regathered. By the way, in Christian circles, guess how many times I've heard that term? Almost never. So now you are the pr privileged few that know the term, the regathering. There's going to be a regathering. This is exciting. Amen. How many want to be there 
when the regathering happens. Now, every day, there is kind of a boredom with the religion. and The Holy Spirit is opening waves of his Holy Spirit coming out to touch the Jews. So this is called the regathering. Amen. I, I think back in almost like 35 years, I read the term the regathering. But all through seminary, I've never heard the term used. But I share that term with you. What does Jezreel mean again? The scattering. So we got to go to the place of Jezreel, which all the seed was scattered. And now what's going to happen on the day of Pentecost, God's going to bring everybody back together. The Jews are coming back. I love the expression, sons of the what? The living God. And do, do you understand that term now? When you read 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, it says to save you from the wrath to come. The wrath of the come comes because of our idolatrous living. And the Jews practice it, but as the Jews practiced it, the Gentiles were steeped into it all the time. That's the only life that we knew. Okay, back with me, please, to Romans 9.27. So chapter 9 is the Jewish passage. So now we come to Isaiah chapter 10, verse 22 and 23. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 22 and 23. So now Isaiah lived also in the 8th century BC. He was a priest down in the south. And where did he preach? He preached in Jerusalem. So Paul says, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the end of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Do you see that? All the Catholics are going to hear the word of God. How many times is everybody going to hear the word of God? Does that mean you go to church, you're saved? No. It's because you sit wearing your white shirt in an office doesn't mean you're saved. No. No, it doesn't mean you're saved. But let's see what he says here. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. So underline verse 27. Only a remnant. I shared with you about a thousand times. The word remnant is Sharif. S H E R I D H. Sharif. When there's a remnant, then you can understand the words of Jesus. Only a few will be saved. I always ask you if your kids are in the kingdom and you mothers just stare at me and you cry and you shake your head. Now, what are we going to do? Divine mercy and fast that those kids get in the kingdom. Is all of my beloveds and my family in the kingdom? No. They say absolutely nonsensical things to me. So I understand our pain. So now they were chosen, verse number 28 of Romans 9. But the Lord will execute his sentence upon the earth with rigor and dispatch. So now we can see that the Jews will not all be in the kingdom. Look at verse 22. But though the, uh, I'm in Isaiah 10 now. Isaiah 10, verse 22 and 23. For though your people be as the sand of the sea, where did they get that from? Abraham. Only a remnant will return. There's the Sharif. 
And remember Matthew 7, Jesus' is the word, only a few will be saved. Now, please, uh, let's get the, the number down. There is no number God gives us. If everybody in the world was saved and one person didn't make it, that would be the few. So I, because God's mercy is incredible, isn't it? I don't know the number. Destruction is decreed overflowing with righteousness. For the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will make a full end as decreed in the midst of the earth. So now what's going to happen when we get into chapter 10 and 11. All the Jews will hear. Then when that says they will all hear, it says all Israel will be saved. When all Israel will be saved, you live in a town called Middletown. And you, you, you live on Thompson Place. And all of a sudden you believe in Jesus. And say this whole town doesn't believe in Jesus. Because you believe, we say, all Middletown is saved. Mm -hmm. Because it takes one person to get the gospel out to everybody. In Acts chapter 8, it was said, when Philip went around preaching in Samaria, Jesus had to get the gospel because he talked to the Samaritan woman. So how many know Jesus had a follow-up to the Samaritan woman? And Philip in Acts chapter 8, does everybody know that? follow-up story and so now because philip went there we could say all of samaria is saved if i can say right now all middletown is saved because i know a couple believers here it's up to them to get the gospel out so how many remember acts 16 31 when Paul was beaten, Philippi, the jailer was saved and his whole family. Do you remember that? Now, a lot of people misquote that and say, well, if I'm saved, my whole family is saved. Not necessarily true. But a lot of people quote that and say, I'm quoting Acts 16, 31. I'm saved and my whole family is going to be saved. That means because of you, your whole family has heard the gospel. Now, personal, personally, I have witnessed to my entire family about who Jesus Christ is. Have they all come around and speaking in tongues by tomorrow morning? No. Even I send them to other people to do the job for me because you can't sometimes minister to your own people. Anybody find that true? Okay. So you send in the Calvary. Amen. So, that's the meaning there. Now, look at verse number um, 29, Romans 9, 29. We're, going, we're looking at Israel past. Amen? Are, are you getting this with me? Now, Israel past here, this is Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. As Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us children, we would have fared like Sodom and Gomorrah. Here's what it says. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, the remnant, everybody box in there, the remnant, we should have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifice, says the Lord. I have had enough of your burnt offerings of um, uh, um, uh, of rams. Remember, rams represent what? Priesthood. And the fat of fed beast. Remember the fat. Amen. Anybody like to eat some fat? Uh, bacon fat. Mmm. Delish. But it's not good for your health. And the fat of fed beast. I do not delight in the blood of bulls. Put in there, Aaron. Uh, or of lambs or of he goats. God doesn't delight that an animal is killed. 
that doesn't give God any fertiles. Why are all those animals killed in the book of Leviticus? For one reason. That you can know that you've got to offer something with life in it because of the sin that was placed upon them by you. Life for what? Life. So now we can see here that in verse 29, that all of them, um, a true prophet, Isaiah lives about 740 BC. He's a priest in Jerusalem. So what happens here is, if you look with me, if you're a true prophet, and give warning to people. You always have to talk about. I told you this a hundred times. Sodom and Gomorrah. Now Jesus uses Sodom and Gomorrah. Where? He uses Sodom and Gomorrah. In um, Matthew 11. So when you use the word of prophecy. Are you a prophet? Yes. How many have ever used to your family Sodom and Gomorrah? When you are really getting them into the word of God, you've got to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen. What does that mean? Let's spell it out. You call sin, sin. You got it? When you call sin, sin, you are talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. There, there's a guy that I pick up in the, um, he'll meet me at the diner and he'll say, oh, Paul, the bill, could two men get married? I said, no way. And every time I see him, I say, it's a man and a woman. Amen. That is only the way Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, um, Romans 1, and 1 Corinthians 6. And I said, I am not changing God's word for anybody. Woe to those people who are not converted. Here's the problem with the Jews today. Now, what we have done is we have sold out our mission to them. If we are biblical Christians, we must preach the gospel. Verse 30. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles did not pursue righteousness, have attained it, but the righteousness through faith? Remember how you get saved is through faith. Romans 1, 16 and 7. You are saved through faith. Then he says to us there, so the righteousness is Jesus' life in us. Verse 31. But Israel pursued the righteousness, which is based on the law did not succeed in fulfilling the law. So now, Right now, everybody here has two ways of being saved. Okay, you ready to choose? Yes. All right, now, you can be saved one of two ways. Are you ready? You could take 613 laws and obey them perfectly. Or you could say, I'm going to come to faith in Jesus Christ and trust his blood atonement on the cross and have his life be lived through me. And even though I fall, get up, walk get up. He forgives me because the blood atonement of the cross. And then he will save me ultimately. All right, everybody make your choice. Push the little buzzer right by you. Choice number one, 613 laws. Or number two. I'm going to trust the finished work of Christ on Calvary. Now, I, I talked to my rabbi friend, and I told you I cried, but yet I was filled with joy. He knew the Catholic response, which the Catholics don't hear about. Here's what he said. He said to me, Father Bill, you have it easier than I do. I'm going to decide to go to heaven on 613 laws. I didn't get sarcastic, but thoughts came to my mind saying, good luck, because you can't do it, can you? Because every one of us flunk the 10. 
every one of us flunk the two. Love God, everybody, and throw kisses to everybody. I don't see some of you throwing kisses to everybody, baby. Let me tell you that. Amen. Do I hear amen? Amen. So, make a decision. So, Paul now here throws out the decision. My rabbi friend says he's going to try the 613. I went, oh, he says, Father Bill, you have it easy. Because listen to what he said. I fell down and he said, you have Jesus do all your dirty work. He said, you have Jesus. And he said this, living in you and because of the righteousness. He understood Romans right here. This is called grace, grace, grace. By the way, what was Paul's favorite book? Genesis, what's his second favorite book? Isaiah. Why do we say those are his favorite books? Because they're the only ones that are so quoted. We believe that he carried around a scroll of Genesis and a scroll of Isaiah. All right, verse number 22. Why? Why? Because they did not pursue it through faith. Now, if you underline the word pursue, in the word in the Greek, it means to hotly go after. How many of you are saved? Do you know you're saved? Yes. How many are hotly pursuing your salvation? So it says there, they didn't go after it. You got to come to Jesus, yes and amen. But then number two, you got to come after Him. Do you see the difference? So why they didn't they didn't pursue it? They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. Circle the word stumbling stone. That is the stone represents Messiah. They had the Messiah in their midst. Who did Jesus primarily talk to? Jews. They stumbled over him. Why did they stumble over him? Because they had too many preconceived ideas of what a Messiah is. May you and I do a little miracle in our heads. Put away your preconceptions. And say to the Lord with me tonight, who are you? So they've stumbled over the stumbling stone. And by the way, you know who mentions that too is First Peter 2. Now we finally come to the end of chapter 9. Verse number 33. Now this is Isaiah 28, 16. So we're going to be going there. And this is the end of um, the 8th century when Isaiah is saying these words. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone that will make men stumble, a rock that will make them fall. He who believes in him will not be put to shame. Now travel with me to Isaiah. Isaiah 28, 16. Now, God is doing something. Let's give you some background. Now, to get the background, please understand with me, Saint, that the background is that there's got to be a cornerstone. They usually put the what? The date on it. So you could put the date on this one, April 5th, 30. That's when Jesus died on the cross. Now, when they had the cornerstone, I told you that the cornerstone 
save the temple from sliding into Gehenna. Everybody know what Gehenna means? It's the garbage heap, another word for hell. Gehenna is in the southwest corner. The temple allegedly, a legend, a legend, is over the gate of hell. It's on the spot where Yitzhak was to be sacrificed by Abraham. There's also another Jewish legend. How many remember in Matthew 16, Jesus said to Peter, you are rock. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. We've been there many times. And to the right where we were in the back of us, where Jesus said those words, they had a temple to the God called Pan. It was a cave. If you went all the way through the cave, you would find the gate of hell. Now, do you remember what Jesus said? The gates of hell will not. Can you understand where they were? Two things Jesus meant. Right behind us is the gate of hell by some belief. And Jerusalem is built. The temple is built right on the gate of hell. So that the door nobody can go there. So now you know what John in Revelation says. He has the keys to life and death. The foundation of Ephesians 1, the foundation was before all time. Number two, the foundation is Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3. Number three, built on the foundation is prophets and apostles. Behold, I am laying in foundation in Zion. So where's the foundation? Zion is the spot of the great regathering. Didn't we just read about that? A stone. Underline the stone. That's Jesus, the Messiah. A tested stone. What is a tested stone? something that's gone through all the rigors. You must be tested. Now, how was Jesus tested? Put a little note there. He was tested by the traps that the religion kept putting in front of him. Every time you read that expression, test, it literally means to set a trap. So when they, how did they test him? They questioned him and they doubted him. So that's how we get to the point where we can see, brothers and sisters, that we've been tested. Can I ask us a question? How many of you have ever been tested? May I make a suggestion to us? We're being tested right now. And I beg you, don't fail this one. What you need to do is praise him, praise him, praise him. Next, he says there, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone that will make men stumble, a rock that will make them fall. Now, the rock is, remember the word is, remember we did this a lot, S-U-R. This is the name, Psalm 18, that God calls himself. So we trip over the rock pot. Here is the thing. Remember Jesus tells us in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, that you've got to build your house on what? 
rock. Remember that? But now notice, here in Isaiah, we get the choice. It's not by living a religion, but it's a faith. Notice in 28.16, faith that saves us. Now, when you read chapter 28 of Isaiah, and we've been through this before, we're going to see people stumbling all over religion. If you go back to Isaiah 28, everybody with me in Isaiah 28? When you go with me, verse 17, I will make justice the line, righteousness the plummet, and hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. So what do we trip over? Lies, and the waters overwhelm the shelter. Verse 18, your covenant of which death will be annulled. So we're on the verge of what? Dying. And the agreement with Sheol, Sheol was the place of the underground, will not stand. What's going to ultimately happen when, when the rock goes there? There's no more Sheol. And the overwhelming scourge passes through, you'll be beaten down by it. As often it passes through, it will take you by morning by morning, it'll pass through by day and night. So we can see that we're always under attack. So we need to be on the rock. So when these waves are coming in, we don't fall down. Do you see that? So here we can say over and over again, we don't want the covenant that God made with us to fall apart. Do I hear? Amen. Now, go with me to Romans 10. Romans chapter 10. Now, we covered... Uh, for a couple of weeks, we covered the Jewish past. Do you understand Jewish past? Do you understand what St. Paul did? He introduced us to the menorah, everything the Jews had. He took us through the Pentateuch. He took us through, um, he took us through the um, Hosea. He took us through Isaiah. He preached to us like a prophet called... Um, through Isaiah, so he was really preaching up a storm to us. Now we come, after 10, to the Jewish present aid. So we're all up to date now. Amen? Are you getting this? So let's go to chapter 10. So now we got a journey from 121. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Now, look at chapter 9, verse 2. Chapter 10, verse 2. I bear them witness. See the bearing the witness again? Look at chapter 9, verse 1. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. See the witness in there again? So what's he trying to do? What every one of us try to do to our families. We want our family to have the regathering. Amen? Amen. And our kids, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. What's he saying, have a zeal for God? He's looking at the religious leaders. And we look at the Jews around us here in Lakewood and everything else. We see them in airports. And we say they really have a zeal for God. So look what Paul says here. But it's they're not light, they're not enlightened. So why did Jesus have difficulty with them? Because they practiced their religion, but there was no conversion to it. So he says to us, now get this, this is so good. Uh, and of course we've got to save it for next week. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God. Now, what does Peter say in Acts 3? 
stop being ignorant. The day of your ignorance is over. When the regathering happens, you have no right to be ignorant. So now, for being, they could have had lived by righteousness. It comes from God and seeking to establish their own. Remember, I'll stick with the 613. They did not submit to God's righteousness. They didn't let God live through them. For Christ is the end of the law. You want to follow 613? You should see Jesus. I told you. I said to them, Rabbi, Jesus is perfectly fulfilled the law. Matthew 7, Matthew 5. And he says, you're right. He said, I believe Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law. And you know what he was reading with me? Romans 9 and Romans 10. For Christ is the end of the law, that everyone who has faith. So you got your choice, the, the 613 law or faith in Jesus. Your choice. You have a choice to make. For me and my house, we choose the Lord and faith in Jesus Christ. Does everybody choose faith in Jesus Christ? We will continue to see, and I believe the Jews are wonderful people, and I love the Jewish people. If I got married, I think I would have been married to a Jew. It had to be converted to uh, mm -hmm. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can you see me with a Jewish woman? Well, I have a Jewish woman, Mama Mary. Amen. 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 Now, so what's your choice? So look at verses one to four. A choice is offered to them. What are they seeing presently? Now look at verse five. Moses. Verse five, Romans 10, five. Moses, circle the word Moses. Remember the word Moses means Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Everybody got that? Every time you see the word Moses, you're supposed to write Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now look what he look what he says there. Moses writes. Now where did Moses write? In the book of Deuteronomy 31, 32, it says he wrote. Does everybody know that passage? He wrote, and let's do this. Moses writes that the man who practices righteousness, which based on the law, shall live by it. Welcome, Moses. It sounds pretty good. So let's look at a few passages that if, let's understand what it means to really, really be Jewish. Everybody go with me to the book Leviticus, chapter 18. Go to verse 5. If you want to have a, a faith based on the law, what are you going to do? You got to live it. This section of Leviticus, chapter 16 to 19. Is called the Holiness Code. Now we're looking at Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5. You shall therefore keep my statutes and ordinance by doing which a man shall live. Now, let's break this down. The first thing, there are commandments. The second thing, there are statutes. Number three, there are ordinances. Let's break it down for you in the modern sense. 
you live by the laws of your faith. Do I hear amen? amen. Secondly, you live by the laws of this country. Do I hear amen? amen. Thirdly, you live by the laws of your state. Fourthly, you live by the laws of your town. Do you see what's going on here? Now, if you put all those things together in your life and not bother anybody, you're okay. Now, notice in Judaism, notice in Judaism, mammoths, statues, and getting what they are by now. The next thing I want to show you with me to Nehemiah 9 29. This is what the Jews got to do today. Nehemiah 9 29. Yet they act presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sin against your ordinances by the observance which a man shall live, and turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. The Jews get a mind-blowing verse only once in the entire Old Testament. How many think you would have found it? Only once in the entire Old Testament. Does it say, man shall live by faith? Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4. Again, it's in the what? Prophets. So what were the Jews? They love Moses, right? And today they read Moses. By the way, the Jews are going through a book right now. Genesis. And so they're studying the book of Genesis right now. And so what are they going to be filled with? We got to obey this. We got to obey that. And what's happening? Do, do I believe they believe? Of course. But do they do they have that faith of salvation? They need Jesus. So all of these <laughs> things are not helping them out at all. And then finally, go with me to Ezekiel 20, verse 11. Did you notice it's all the statues and ordinances? So what is Paul saying? You have a Bible in front of you that fills you with statues and ordinances. Was it true? Yes. But now you have a grace awakening. Messiah has come. He says to us there, by them my statutes and show them my ordinances by whose observance man shall live. Have you seen in every case man shall live? So when you talk to a Jew today, that's what they're going to tell you. And it sounds like the Catholic of yesteryear, even today, I obey the Ten Commandments. What else do I need? Isn't that sad? I won't talk to you about Jesus because I obey the Ten Commandments. And that grieves my heart. Heavenly Father, we just ask your blessings and we thank you for this time in the Word. We thank you for our elder brothers, the Jews. We can understand their difficulty because we understand ours. We just don't want to be a, a monolithic willed church. We want to be people alive in the Spirit. But give us truth, give us access into the heavenly into the heavenly realm where you are Lord God, Savior, and you live in us and fill us with peace and joy. And please, mercy, mercy, and mercy. Amen.